I want to introduce our speaker for the night, and um, I'm really excited, and I love to see the turnout, too. We've got 150 people here, um, and that does not surprise me because we have Noah Siegel, who is going to be giving our talk, Under Pressure, Evolution Oddities in the Fungal World. And Noah is just an incredible field mycologist and photographer, really just skilled, skilled photographer. Um, and he's been doing it for... I think three decades, which is impressive because he's, you know, not not an older person. He's been doing it since I think since he was a kid. Um, and anyway, so he's hunted for mushrooms basically all over the U.S. He does a lot of work on the West Coast where he's published some really fabulous books like Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast and I think more forthcoming. But he's also done expeditions around the world to New Zealand and um, Australia and even uh, Cameroon. And he's won tons and tons of um, prizes for his photography, especially from NAMA. Um, and I, I love to look at Noah's photography because um, the thing that I, I the thing that I love is he captures every detail about the mushroom in one picture. Um, we always say, you know, like try to show as many kind of angles or parts as you can. Um, well, he really does that, but he also makes it beautiful. I think when I do that, it's like ends up looking like someone vomited, you know, a bag of mushrooms at all these angles. And he just has a way of making it look natural and yet showing every part of it and even showing often, you know, aspects of the of the habitat too. like um, he'll get in, um, you know, maybe needles or cones or leaves or, or whatever is going to. So there's just so much information in there but also so much beauty. And so I he, I admire his work so much. Um, like I said, he's authored uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. Um, and I think uh, he also is working on a new book called Mushrooms of Cascadia, which is for Pacific Northwest fungi. And he travels all around the world lecturing about mushrooms. So um, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, so like you mentioned, I, I mushroom all over the place. I I mean, for, for years I've been saying that my interest is in wanting to know what every single mushroom is. And so that means most waking hours are looking, reading whatever I can on fungi. And while I was, you know, while I was waiting, I was just flipping through from the fungi temperate Europe. If you don't have this book, go get it because it has what 3,000 or so mushrooms in it. And you can learn them all. Um, so it just, but you quickly come to realize that you will never know what everything is. You know, in some regions, it's not an underestimate to say about 50% of the mushrooms there are undescribed. Even in the Northeast, where there's been quite a bit of work done, um, you know, 20, 30% of the stuff you out there and find is going to be an undescribed species. So, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's pointless trying to put names on stuff. And so the next question is, okay, so if I can't put a name on this, um, it's like the curiosity is what is it doing? And if you think that naming stuff is hard, saying what mushrooms are actually doing when we don't see them, you know, when we're not seeing the, the fruit body, um, there's a whole bunch of unknowns there. And so it, you know, you'll, you'll start going down that road and then you'll just throw up your hands and okay, so I don't know what they are or what they're doing. What's the point anymore? Um, so what, what, I, what I'm just going to tell, I'm going to give some random, what I usually do in this talk is just like pick some, some features that mushrooms have evolved to do and tell them to you. And so, you know, I have, I have a, you know, a bunch of different things here, a few different sections. Um, for questions, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And like, Annie, if you want to interrupt me at any times, you can do that if I miss something. Um, and so, so I can, um, you know, I, but I will, I will try good. to yeah. keep an eye on, on, on the chat. And, and no, we can definitely keep an eye for you. Yep. And then the first one, um, so on, on this first slide, so what do we have here? We have a hedgehog mushroom, you know, it would, you know, the hypnums, uh, hypnum rapandum was the name we used for it until we realized that there's about 20 different species of hypnum in North America. And I think you had um, Alfredo speak on, on, hidden them species. Uh, there's quite a few of them. Uh, but we can ignore what species are here and just look at what it's doing. And in this particular case, this is a fruit body from the Oregon coast. 
and it's on the fog drip zone. So it's, you know, it's where they get, they get, you know, the wet season, which is you know, usually October um, through March or April. And then over the summer season, it doesn't rain a whole lot, but they get, they get fog drip moisture. And so hiddenums in that area, because they have indeterminate growth, so they're, they're coming up and growing, you know, whenever it's wet, um, they have the ability to just like grow these giant mutated fruit bodies out of the previous year's fruit body. So they're, you know, I wouldn't call them perennial, but they're certainly lasting longer than, than you know, two or three weeks or a month where, you know, where, where you would normally find them. You know, think of a, a hedgehog mushroom coming up here in, in, in you know, say mid-October, um, by, by mid-November, it's gonna be frozen and won't be able to grow anymore. But in, in this particular area, uh, they can continue growing the following years. And so I just use this as a, a point of environmental pressures that, uh, you know, for this particular mushroom, this particular place allows it to do that. And so when this happens over millions and millions of years, then mushrooms start doing weird things. So we're, we're gonna look at some of these weird things mushrooms have done, and we will start with um, this question right here. So we have three mushrooms here, right? These, we're going side by side on the California coast. And what we have here is the, um, the ear pick fungus or the, the, the cone tooth fungus oroscalpium. And so oroscalpium, it you know, comes up, it has that, that stalk off to the side, lateral stalk, and that little cap on top. And then on the other side, you see it has all those little spines, those little teeth coming down. We have another mushroom, the, the pseudohydnum, that does the exact same thing. In the fact that it's a stem off to the side, that little overhanging cap and spines coming down on the other side, but it's got a gelatinous texture to it. So, and then, and then the third one here, the jelly baby or chicken lips, they often call in California, the leosha, it has the same texture as the jelly tooth, you know, the, the, you know, the rubbery gelatinous texture, the gummy bear texture. Uh, but it doesn't, it has a central stem, kind of like this rounded top to it, no spines or anything. So now looking at these things, um, and we want to make a field guide, where do we put these things in the field guide? Do we put them, uh, you know, do we put the two, the, the leosha and the, the pseudohydnum together because of gelatinous texture? Or do we put it in the group with the spines because they both have spines on the underside of the cap, these little teeth sticking down. Do we put those together like that? Um, but when you when you start looking at them closer, and you have to say, okay, what if I want to do my my mushroom book, and I want to put stuff that's closely related to together, um, then it becomes an issue because you realize that if stuff has spines, um, doesn't exactly mean it's closely related. And so we'll use an example of, of convergent evolution with, with some animals here. And of course, you know, the, the new world porcupines, the porcupines we have here in, in, in North America, uh, compared to the old world porcupines of, of mostly Africa. Um, yeah, they're both porcupines, but <laughs> we have hedgehogs and, and the actual hedgehog, not the hedgehog mushroom. And how many people, when they find hedgehogs, ask, can I eat them? Okay, but you all do it for the mushrooms, huh? A tenrex, which is an oddball from most of the spiny ones that are from Madagascar, and echidnas, which are in Australia and New Guinea. But when we look at what they're closely related to, you realize that there's a lot of different rodents in between New World and Old World porcupines. Hedgehogs' closest, li 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 closest living relatives are shrews. Uh, the Tenrex closest living relatives are stuff like elephants. Doesn't make much sense there. And, and dusties, rock dusties, um, which are these little, you know, like guinea pig-like animals that lives in rocky areas and little shrubs in Africa. And of course, Echidna's closest li living relative is the platypus. Um, you know, these egg-laying monoterms that really don't, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, non-existent lineage pretty much except in Australia. So when we're looking at mushrooms and they have spines, we have to think about it in the exact same way because 
with every single form of, of, of mushrooms, it's a, it's a gross morphological form that has evolved multiple times. And so here's a case of the hedgehog mushroom, the one that people won't frown upon you if you eat. The, the, you know, the jelly hogs or the, the pseudohydnum, the, the jelly tooth fungus, and stuff like hydnellums and, you know, bancaraceae, the, um, you know, the tough woody tooth fungi or hawks wings, another one group. And someone on here is not muted. So if you can mute yourself. And this little teeny, like little shell fungus um, from New Zealand, with like the, you know, just that little flat shell with the spines on their side and the, the, the cone tooth or ear pick fungus, all of these things have spines. But when we look at what their closest relatives are, well, they're all over the board. So hedgehogs and chanterelles, really close related. The, the jelly tooth is a jelly fungus. So, you know, stuff like witch's butter. But, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the hedgehog, uh, I'm sorry, with the, with the hidnellums and the, the sarcanons, they're in this group of, of um, teleferase tele, uh, and stuff like belladon is really closely related to telephora. This thing here, these white spored um, tooth fungi are really closely related. And then this little thing from New Zealand, closely related to Romeria, ear pick fungus is in Russellaceae, along with herisium, you know, that, that are spiny mushroom that grows on wood. So here are, you know, the, this growth morph morphological form that has evolved okay. again and again and again. And even within polypores, it evolved at least five different times. And so why are mushrooms doing this? Um, they are, um, you know, when, when we look at a mushroom, think of, think of you know, the, 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 the mushroom over here, or the, you know, the cap on top of the, of the stem. Um, and where are they producing their spores? So on these particular ones, they're producing it on the spines. So if you have a, you know, the, the, the fruiting surface, you know, say the underside of this polypore shelf here, where you just had that, that flat surface and, and it was producing spores, it would only be along that flat surface. But then as soon as you start putting all these little fingers down, these little spines down, and the spores are producing on every single surface there, it increases surface area. More surface area equals more spores equals better chance of survival. And so what I, you know, an example of this was when I was doing work in, in California for mushrooms at Redwood Coast, it was, you know, there's some pretty bad drought years there. And one of the, one of the fungus fairs I was working, it's one of the Santa Cruz fungus fairs, someone brought in um, the Jumbo Gym, Genopolis Ventricosis, which, you know, they can get big. The caps, are, this particular one was about 10 inches across or so. So, you know, dinner plate size. And being bored because nobody was bringing in mushrooms at ID table, I started cutting up this mushroom and cutting out all the gills from that mushroom and laying them out on the table in front of me. And by the time I had that whole mushroom done, it covered about, you know, the, the three foot by six foot table I was sitting at pretty much covered in gills. So here was this 10 inch cap that had a surface area, spore producing surface area of two tables, because you remember it's producing spores on both sides of those gills. So that is the advantage of, you know, the spines, the gills. Gills have evolved about 15 different times with fungi you know, independently evolved. Like Russellus are, are an independent lineage from, from you know, an agaricus. So these, these fruit body forms have evolved multiple times, just as with, you know, the, the animals with spines, well, that's a pretty good protective feature for them. Um, you know, when you have additional surface area for fungi, it's pretty good. There's other fungi like, like chanterelles that, you know, they have, they are smooth and, most craterellus um, to gill-like or ridge-like, you know, we call them ridges just to confuse you. Um, you know, they, they, on some species of chanterelles, they look like gills and we tell you they're not gills. It's just like we tell you sport prints are pink. Yeah, mycologist terms of pink is not exactly regular people's idea of pink. Um, but we have, we have, you know, this, this Cantrell Severius group, I'm not going to get too much into names here. There's a lot of different species here too. Uh, but you have that, you know, those shallow ridge-like structures on the underside of the cap and a lot of them. And when you start looking, you get that with things like, you know, what we call the blue chanterelle or scaly base chanterelle or the pig's ear. Um, pig's ear is one that in California, they, um, 
you know, it used to like nobody, you know, a couple of people would pick this thing and eat it, but usually not. Um, someone came up with the bright idea of calling it violet chanterelles and turned what, what used to be a worthless mushroom into a 20 some dollar a pound edible mushroom where you can go to the store and buy it under the name violet chanterelle now. Didn't change the taste of it at all. So, but, you know, because it's a chanterelle. But when you look at them closer, you realize that yeah, even though these have the ridges and veins on the underside like chanterelles, and we call them chanterelles, and stuff like the, the blue chanterelles are actually closely related to these tooth fungi, uh, you know, the hidden elums, um, and, you know, and bolitopsis, so that poroid fungus, are all in the same family. And we look at the spores, they're really similar. They have these unique shapes, like they're like little jacks, like little nodules coming out of these spores. Um, and so they have they have really unique spores. They also give the same pigment. So if you're dyeing wool with mushrooms, uh, you get the same blue green colors from these tooth fungi as you do with with the uh, polyozelis, the um, you know the blue chanterelle. But then when you look at the pig's ear, the violet chanterelle, you notice that they're really closely related to Romeria, uh, the, you know, so the coral fungi. And you can even see that stuff, stuff like, you know, this Romeria here has the same overall coloration of the, you know, the brownish, grayish beige top with the violet lower down. Um, it's just really similar coloration to these two species and they're pretty closely related. Something else that's happening a lot with fungi is there's the sacoshoid and hypogeous forms. So these truffle-like forms for a lot of different fungi. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this talk, but here's an example of a area, which is a Romeria that's gone underground. So it's a truffle form of a Romeria. So here's, you know, this examples of convergent evolution where you know, these, these fruit body forms work and there's reasons for them to work and reasons for them to become truffle-like um, versus, you know, above ground fruit bodies. Um, so there's, you know, there's usually reasons anyway. But when we look at this with, you know, these, these gastromyces, these puffball-like things, um, stuff like uh, the sclerodermas are the, the earth balls or, you know, the, the pigskin poison puffball. Um, the, this one is the earth star earth ball. It's the one that opens up into a earth star like thing. The, the skin on it peels back and exposes the spore mass for dispersal. Stuff like the pyzolytis, it's often called the dog turd fungus. Um, each of these little different color, like these stained glass um, packets are spore packets that start maturing from the top down. And so when they're mature, they're this powdery spore mass and, you know, rain hits them, the spores are dispersed off into the wind. And stuff like uh, the astraeus is one that has a puffball inside of these arms. And what's unique, neat about these is the arms open when it's wet and when it's dry, they close back up. So they, you know, they'll close up around that puffball-like structure on the inside. When it's dry, as soon as water hits them, they'll open right up. And you can actually watch them do this. You know, just pour water on them and you can watch them open. And then there's things like calistoma. And this is where mushrooms make no sense. Because, um, you know, calistoma is just, it's weird. Um, but when you look at what all of these things here are fairly closely related to bullies. So they're all close relatives of bullies. Clopes are related to beliefs than swillus, the slippery jacks. And so this whole group here, and they're not very closely related at all to, um, you know, the normal puffballs, which are our closest relatives are like white button mushrooms. So, you know, those gilled mushrooms, and they're not all that closely related to earth stars, um, you know, like um, the geastrums. So geastrum saccadum or saccadum group. And this is actually a photograph I took on um, the last time I spoke for, for DC Club when we did the walk in um, Rock Creek Park. So that was a photograph from that, the day we did that walk. But then calistoma, this thing, like I said, why do mushrooms do this? So when you look at this thing, it's the slime covered um, cartilaginous stem puffball 
So he, you know, it has the powdery spore mass inside this packet that's covered with that, that goo. They have these bright red lips on them that kind of like when it's mature, break open and then the spores puff out of it. I guess it just wants to be cool. It just wants to be different. Uh, but then Calistoma, uh, it occurs in Eastern North America, um, Japan down into Southeast Asia, and then New Zealand and Australia. So it's a really weird distribution, not very many species. And so, yeah, so, so it just wanted to be different. And so before I move on, does anybody have any questions about um, morphological forms of fruit bodies of fungi or anything like that? So the next thing I'm gonna to touch on is, is you know, specialized habitats for fungi. And so what we should really think about is if there are, you know, if, if a bear poops in the woods, there's a fungus to rot it. Pretty much every single thing out there has a fungus growing associated with it, on it, uh, decaying it, you know, allowing it to grow. Uh, you know, it just everything out there, including us, have, have a lot of different fungi on them and growing with them. And so, yeah, when we think of, you know, when we think of, you know, mushroom hunting, you know, well, we want to go hunt morels. We're probably going to go to ash forest or tulip poplar. You know, we're going to go to the, the trees it's associated with. You know, when we want to hunt chanterelles in, in the D.C. area, probably heading to oak woodlands, right? Uh, you know, or you go over to West Virginia and you hunt the chanterelles that grow with the conifers there. You hunt your boletes, you know, your edulis with the spruce. So everything has its niche, has its habitats. And some of them, like um, like sand dunes, is not a spot you would normally go for mushrooms. Um, and I think it, it is worth mentioning that uh, one of the the first time I met Annie was because she posted mushrooms on INAT, and I messaged her, you know, just random person messaging her on the internet saying, "Can you take me to these mushrooms?" Because she found this bolete that grows in Cape Cod that literally grows out in the middle of the sand dunes, but it's associated with the roots of the oaks or the pines in the area, but they are, you know, they're 40, 50 feet out in the middle of the sand away from these trees. And so it's quite the sight to see. And um, with this particular one, it is growing on the roots of the dune grass and the stems of the dune grass that get buried. And so what we're looking at here is the shifting sands, the wind blowing the sands are covering up the organic matter here. Um, you know, burying parts of the, you know, the grass stems and stuff. And then these mushrooms are growing off of that. They're decaying those stems that are stuck underground. So, you know, the, that's its niche. That's where you're going to find it. You can find this thing, you know, pretty much around the world on, on sand dunes. No, you have a question. Sorry to interrupt. You have a little question yeah. um, in the chat. Uh, Nikki asked, when you say related to, is that because they have a percentage of the same DNA sequence? Oh, so when I say related to, it's like, um, you know, well, if you believe in evolution, if you don't, you should probably leave this talk. Um, it's like we are related to chimpanzees. So, you know, they, we're close relatives. And so, yeah, we are related to fungi. Uh, you know, it really, I mean, it irks me when you read in books that say not related to this. Well, if you believe in evolution, we, we, we are related to everything. When I'm saying related to, I'm closely related to, so uh, like when I said for the, you know, the sclerodermis, those things related, they're closely related to beliefs. So um, sclerodermatese is a, are, uh, you know, it's in bullet haley. So bullet haley's um, would have, you know, these different families in it. So that order have a different, like the, the Swillis, the Swillil, you know, Swillacy, Rhizopogonaceae, which some people lump in with Swillis, um, Bulletaceae, uh, Sclerodermatacea. So stuff like Sclerodermatacea is closely related to Bulletaceae, so the you know, normal bolete mushrooms, and stuff like Gyrodon is in Sclerodermatacea. So your chestnut bolets are in the family with the, um, you know, with the earth balls. So when, so it's, it's, and part of this, I mean, a lot of, 
a lot of these connections were made. Um, there's a mycologist Donk in the early 70s who made a lot of these connections and was kind of laughed at at the time. Um, but he was using, you know, spore morphology. Micromorphology is a lot more, um, it's a lot more constant. So it doesn't change over time. So macro fruit body morphology changes all, of, all the time. And stuff like, you know, Bondarzuia, that big polypore-like thing. When you look at the spores, they look identical to lactaria spores and it is closely related to lactaria spores. So DNA has shown this, has confirmed this, but there are people who are saying this long before DNA um, for some of these things, not everything. A couple of things have been surprises, but you know, with, with stuff like um, you know, the blue chanterelle, it's easy to see microscopically that it belongs in the group with, with telephora just based on micromorphology, you know, the spores and, and structures, clamp connections and stuff like that on, you know, on the micro characters. So I hope that answered the question and didn't take too long. Uh, but yeah, so it's like, it's like, you know, saying closely related, it's like us and great apes, um, distantly related to us and elephants. So, you know, yeah, um, you know, a jelly fungus is distantly related to a gilled mushroom, but they're still related. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I, that's what happens when I scroll my mouse on the screen and not on the chat questions. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is a specialized niche, but you do get a you know a handful of fungi in that that sandy habitat. Of course, you know a lot of people know dung fungi. Mitch showed that that paniolus earlier on here, um, and and dung fungi. You know, there's not a whole lot of species, but there's a group of species that that's where you're going to find them. And for anybody who's bored in the winter and can't just go off to where there's actual mushroom, just go outside and collect some herbivore, you know, some grazing dung. Uh, so deer is usually pretty good and put it into a, a Tupperware container with like a, um, you know, just put a moist paper towel at the bottom, put the dung in it and then watch the progression of stuff that fruits on it. Uh, if you have roommates who eat your food in the fridge, probably want to label it or, you know, they'll learn their lesson pretty quickly. Um, but you'll get this progression of these little teeny cut fungi and some really spectacular ones, you know, these like little hairs and stuff coming out of them. Then you get stuff like the coprinoids, zanky caps, uh, when it, you know, the larger piles of dung, they'll get stuff like the protostropharia. When the dung becomes more decayed, uh, you start getting a different progression, different ascomycetes, stuff like paniolus. Paniolus is not really on the, the fresh, fresh stuff, but you know, from anywhere from three weeks or so, a month after it's left the animal, um, you know, you get this progression of stuff growing on it. We got two dung and, questions. If you, I don't yeah, know if you see so them. I'll good. touch on those. So yes, so, so with dung fungi, the trick is for them to, of course, grow in, the, grow in the dung, but then get their spores far enough away from the dung that say the cow will come back and eat it. And so it, so, the dung fungi want their spores to pass through the digestive, digestive tract of the, the grazing animal. And then they have a, you know, they have a head start. As soon as it hits the ground, they can start growing. But cows don't eat around their own poop. And so some of these fungi, like, um, you know, the little cannonball fungi, these little dung fungi that uh, these, uh, have this little teeny ball on a, on a stem, and then it proceeds to shoot that, which is the spore pack, and she proceeds to shoot that about a half a meter or so away from the dung uh, where the cow will eat it. And then it can get back in the digestive tract. If you look at a lot of these dung fungi, they have dark pigmented spores uh, and often thick walled spores. So spores that can easily pass through digestive tracts and survive. And, you know, and a lot of these things are really widespread because these darkly pigmented spores um, can survive long distances and you know and passing through animal digestive tracts and then how long um for fungi to start fruiting from dung uh, probably i mean it all depends on the size like a, the big juicy cow patties will take a little bit longer uh, than like a small rabbit pellet um, but usually with like two to three weeks, you can start getting the, the small ascos from the little pellets from deer or rabbit. 
Uh, but yeah, usually within a month, you'll start, you'll start seeing stuff. So, you know, just go out there and collect some rabbit pellets or, or deer droppings and, and stick them into that Tupperware and, and watch the progression because it doesn't take that long. Some of them are really small though. So you, you do have to like hold that dung right up to your face with your loop and, you know, look for them. Don't be afraid of um, herbivore dung, you know, so if it's, so if it's um, you know, rabbits or, or deer, uh, it's not a good idea to, to handle predator dung. So they are um, fox, you know, cats, stay away from that stuff. That's, that's where it starts getting some yucky stuff on it. Um, but other things like, like uh, so what do you think these are? These are owl pellets. Okay, so this is where, you know, the owl goes and eats the, um, you know, eats the birds, eats the rodents, and then coughs up the hairball with the hair, the fur, the bones, the feathers. And then what we have here are these little um, anigena, which are a fungus that grows on bird feathers most of the time. It grows on hair as well. And so these little teeny anigena, well, that's their habitat. So there, there's uh, two species in North America. One grows on the bird feathers and, and fur, and the other one grows on the hoofs and antlers of stuff like, you know, like a cow or a goat. And so, so those are, you know, those are, you know, the, the one anigena corvina, you know, corvine bird, it grows, it grows on, the, on the bird feathers. Um, and anigena equina will grow on the hoofs and horns. So they are fascinating fungi. So anytime you see some, some dead things, you should go look for these fungi. Uh, but then the, where I've seen the most of the anigena has been on the, on the owl pellets. Um, and I would, and th so this, this is an example of, of it growing on elk hair. And I'm, I'm going to warn people who are a little bit squeamish, there's going to be a couple of dead animal photos here. So if you don't want to see that, probably a good time for a bathroom break or something. Um, so here's an example of, of the Anigida corvina, the one that's typically on, on bird feathers on the elk hair. And so this is what this looked like. And so this was an elk that died just out near Mount, Ma Mount Rainier in Washington. And you can see the decaying hair and ear and all these little specks here are the anigena growing on it. Um, unfortunately, this didn't have the, the one that grows in the hoofs. So it would have been really cool to see that. I haven't seen that one. Um, but it leads to this whole question of, okay, so, so here we have dead animals. There must be fungi to grow on them, right? Um, who's seen this photo online and are you sick of it? So I kind of took this as a joke because I had a friend who was working on um, doing this, these studies on what was, you know, what was decaying these, these pig skeletons they're throwing out, this um, taphronomy study they were doing, and her job was to look at the fungi on them. And I kept getting photographs of these these rotten pig heads with like these little molds and stuff growing on them. And I saw so I said, you know, I was kind of I said, dump these things in the forest. They dumped them out in the field somewhere. I said, dump them in the forest. We actually have a chance for the the ECM fungi, the ectomycorrhizal fungi, growing with them. Um, and so I I just like you know I was photographing this mushroom in New Zealand. I said, okay, so you're sending me these pig heads. Here's a dead claw with mushrooms growing in it. And so here's what I what we found that this was in New Zealand, where it was a bunch of, of um, brush-tailed possums, which are an invasive species in New Zealand. They were introduced from Australia for the fur trade, but then they got to New Zealand and realized that they liked eating the trees there, eating a lot of trees there, um, so much so that they're you know making trees go extinct. Um, so doing quite a bit of damage in, the, in this habitat that had no controls for them. So, so the Department of Conservation does a lot of trapping of the possum to try to control the numbers. And so this was a particular spot that, and I am gonna warn you, there is, um, you know, these, there's gonna be some dead possum photos. But anyway, so there's this group of fungi that grow with decaying carcasses. And so it's it's they're growing off the ammonium and nitrates that these 
that these corpses are putting off, you know, the, the leeching off. Um, and, and, you know, so you'll get this clump in the soil where you have all this stuff leaching and it allows these ectomycorrhizal fungi, so these fungi growing symbiotically with these trees to, um, to fruit in these large flushes around that. So yes, they can normally fruit, um, you know, here and there in the forest, you know, so just scattered here and there. But then when you get these, when you get these uh, nitrate flushes, it allows a large number of these fungi to fruit. And so it looks like this, where, you know, you get these, these possum carcasses or whatever dies there. Um, and it just allows these large groups of mushrooms to grow around these things. So here is this, you know, the trapping where they're trapping the possums. Uh, probably within the, the carcasses that were about a year old had the mushrooms around them. So, it, you know, they would look like this. So you can see there's still signs of, of the, the skin, lots of bones still there, and then all these mushrooms growing around them. And this is a mushroom that you'll see in the this is in the Antarctic beach forest down there. You'll see one here, one there, but then if you get a carcass or something like that, you'll get a big flush of them. There's examples of this in North America as well, but with Lucaria, but especially with Hebeloma, and Hebelomas are often called the corpse finders. Um, but what else has like a lot of nitrogen in it? And so this is something you can find in campgrounds a lot. So when people are in campgrounds, they're in their tent, they don't wanna walk over to the bathroom block, they're just gonna to go to the nearest tree and go to the bathroom behind the tree. And then you get these large clumps of Hebeloma. So if you wanna find Hebeloma in North America, campgrounds are really good for it. Uh, and that's because this, this particular one is growing off a, a where someone you know, used the forest for a bathroom. Um, but you also get it, so this is another example of one that was growing with a, uh, deer carcass, that was in a row kill deer carcass. Or an example of um, where someone threw a chicken carcass out, also at a campground, and then all these hebeloma popped up around it. So a lot of these, these mushrooms are, are occurring in that habitat, they're growing there, but when they get that, that, you know, that ammonia and nitrate flush in one spot, it allows, it's a lot of energy for them and it allows a mass fruiting in one spot. And so this is another bathroom spot, hebeloma. So, so, so when you're in these campgrounds, you see these clumps of hebelomas. Luckily, hebelomas are they're often called poison pies. They're not much into your eating. Um, but you know, typically when you see a group of hebeloma growing in a campground, you can assume why it's there. Um, let me just check the questions here. And yes, and so mushroom growth, fungal growth does determine the time of death. As it, it's also it's used with like what what um, you know what bacteria are on it, what insects are on it. So there's you know the, all these different these you know these different stage decays will be able to tell you okay so if, if fungus X is there it's this old um, you know or or if insect X or you know bacteria is, so different things will come in at different stages. And so a lot of these ECM fungi are one to two years post. And then there's like, there's some little ascomycetes and you know, some molds and stuff like that that are um, pretty immediate, like you know, within a month of, of death that they're on the carcass. And then, um, so what are, so moving on to, to fungi on the more specialized habitats, there's a lot of fungi that are on our, on that are fungi. So if you really want something cool to study, I and mean, forget cordyceps, I left cordyceps out because they're way too popular for me and they're too mainstream. Um, you know, fungi and insects, yeah. Fungi and fungi, a lot cooler. So, you know, on, on this slide here, you can see you have this hypomyces that grows on helbella. So it's a helbella mold. Um, stuff like bolete molds are really common. The um, tulipcladium is, or used to be called a lap of cordyceps are the ones that grow on the false truffles, the, the deer truffle, the lapomyces, and stuff like dendrocalibia is one that grows on um, old russula and, and um, you know, lactarius remains usually. Uh, the, the question here, the name of the purple mushroom growing from the animal claw was Lacaria mansoniae, uh, which is, Lacarias are a common, lackluster Lacaria is a common name. It's a common fungus in, um, 
in forested settings, especially younger forests. Uh, and it really loves pine. It's a really common fungus in um, younger forests. And then, you know, across, across the Northern Hemisphere, missing from the tropics, but then in ECM fungi in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Probably about 30 or so species in New Zealand alone. Some of the cooler fungi on, on fungi are this particular one here. Um, I've only seen this thing three times. And the first time I saw two years when I first started, so this was 89, 90, so long time ago. And then again, I think it was like 2013 or maybe it was 2014, um, someone posted a picture of this particular clump on Facebook in one of the ID groups. It was a lot younger then. Um, it's just like these little cups with these little balls coming out of it. And so I was like, oh, this thing, you know, what is this thing? And it's like, well, well, I know exactly what that thing is, but it's been almost 20 years at the time since I've seen it. Um, and it was in Michigan. I said, okay, I'll be there the next day. So, you know, drove out there. I was driving sort of by, I was on, you know, just about to drive out west, um, made a few hundred mile detour just to go get this mushroom. And so, um, you know, I talked to this guy, you know, just cannot, connecting random people on the internet and asking him, like, can I come see your mushroom? Um, he said, sure. And then I get a message from him. It's like, well, my wife doesn't want you to come there. I was like, okay, can you dig it up for me? And so he actually, he dug up this mushroom, put it in a Tupperware container. I met him at work and picked it up. And I proceeded to like row it out in the car for the next week. Um, and so what this is, is it's a satharella. So these brittle stems that grows on shaggy manes. So it turns the shaggy mane into that little cup-like structure. Um, so completely deforms it. And then it grows up out of the middle of that cup with this little teeny fruit body. So and it's, it's widespread, but rare. There's only about 20 or so records of it. Um, you know, it's, it's, like I said, I've seen it. I've seen it one patch, had it for two straight years. And then I went 20 some years without seeing it. I haven't seen it since this one. So, you, you know, you're not gonna see this one very often. There's, a, there's better things like um, uh, squam, squamanita, which grow all, out of a bunch of, you know, a bunch of different hosts, but they're pretty much, they're taking over the mushroom they're growing on. So it's a normal gilled mushroom and all of a sudden they uses the base of the stem, but then a new mushroom grows up out of the top of it. Um, and so just, you know, there's, there's these weird basidium IT fungal parasite. This is another one, this is the Vovariella serecta. And so what this one does is it um, deforms Clytospin nebularis, this mushroom here, into these mangle clumps and then grows up out of that. And so this is actually, um, I've seen this one three times in North America, but then a bunch in New Zealand where both the Clytospin nebularis was introduced to New Zealand, but also the Vovariella. And it's actually pretty common in New Zealand now uh, where the weed mushroom, so nebularis is just everywhere. Uh, but then, you know, the, the clytosophy is growing on it there every once in a while as well. So it's a, you know, look for it. Anytime you see the clytosophy, look around for any deformed fruit body. And then on those deformed fruit bodies, you get these tiny little silky white mushrooms with pink gills and pink spores growing up out of them. There's a bunch of more common fungi growing in other fungi. Um, uh, so the, uh, the question was, like, does it grow on Clytospin nebularis in the east or something like Clytospin robusta? Well, it turns out that what we call nebularis and robusta have the same ITS DNA. So, you know, they're either the same species or something that's really closely related and it will, it'll grow on the robusta and nebularis-like species. So, you know, if it's all the same, white cap versus gray cap, or if it's two different species, it grows on both of them. There's a bunch of more common fungi and fungi and stuff, stuff like the colibias, you know, colibia tuberosa, they form those little apple seed like sclerotia and then grow up out of them or there's colibia cookeri. You know, these are really common in the, in the, in the forests around here. A little bit less common are stuff like Asterophora. And so what's really neat about Asterophora is actually um, Asterophora lycopodeodes. So it looks like lycoperdon, which is the puffball. Uh, the cap of this mushroom disintegrates into these asexual spores, these conidial spores. 
And they're actually, you know, Asteropterus refers to like the star shape of the spore. Um, and they, you know, they grow up out of the mushroom caps like that. But then there's this one. So this is one that these are some decaying nicarias that starting off with these little like fuzzy white balls and they turn gray harder and eventually these black, little hard black balls. Um, that's this Dendrocolibia racemosa. And so Dendrocolibia not only produces the normal, you know, the sexual basidial spores on the gills, it also produces asexual conidial spores on all the tips of these little branches. So it has both the, you know, the, the asexual spores and sexual spores. So why would it do this? And why also has this happened with Asperophora? But you gotta think about this. So this is a mushroom that has to infect the gilled mushroom while it's still up. Um, and it has to start growing right away. So pretty much what these asexual spores can do is it's pretty much a clone immediately lands on this, you know, brussel that's starting to go by, starts growing, colonates it. As that mushroom's decaying, gets enough nutrients to store up into that little sporosum, that little pack there. And then the following rainy season, uh, will grow up out of it. So you'll have the mushroom nutrients all in that little packet there, waiting for the next rainy season, and then it start, you know, grows up and does it again. And one neat thing about the, the dendrocalibia is you can find them a lot like this without even the cap on them. So just these, these stems of the canidial spores. So keep an eye out for um, my co author in the Redwood Coast book, Christian Schwartz, found this mushroom in New Hampshire. So only East Coast record of it. Uh, it's fairly common out West, but keep an eye out for it out back East. It's small, um, you know, usually about a quarter inch across or so. Um, but, you know, it's a neat little one. A second species we found, we haven't described yet, uh, is this little teeny one from California uh, with these really dense, short canidial pegs on the stem. And then the sclerotium is, is larger comparatively. It's a smaller mushroom. So this one's uh, maybe a half inch tall. And, you know, so, I, you know, less than a quarter inch wide. Um, but, you know, it, it has a, a large irregular shaped sclerosa compared to the, you know, the little round balls of the, the ventricolibia racemosa. So moving on to, uh, this is another mushroom specialized habitat thing. We have mushrooms in snow. So you don't really think of, of snow banks as being mushroom habitat, especially here in the east. But in the western mountains, you have this phenomenon with these snow bank fungi where this is, this is Mount Shasta, which is the um, second furthest south volcano in the uh, Cascade Range. So it's in far northern California. Mount Lassen's a, you know, about 100 miles south of that in California. Um, and then you, know, you have the, the, the western Cascade Range, the Rocky Mountains. In, in, the, in the Montane West, you get these fungi that grow on the east edges of snowbank. So, Snow line here on, on or the tree line here is about 8,000 feet. So we're going up right now to about 7,000 feet in late May. And this is what it looks like as the snow melts. So yeah, in, you know, in the middle of the winter, the snowpack you can see it's about up, it's about five or six feet on this, this elevation. And you can see that based on the Letharia, the wolf lichen on the tree, pretty much these bands where it doesn't exist is under snow in the winter. So the Letharia just can't survive underneath the snow uh, in the snowpack. But then as these snowbanks melt, you start getting all these fungi that fruit in association with the melting snowpack. And so today they'd be coming up right on these edges of the snowpack. Um, stuff from a few days earlier would be out here and drying up and starting to go by. And so it looks sort of like this. And so you have all these fungi that, you know, about 40 different species or so, that fruit in association with that melting snowpack. And so most of them are getting the heat to melt through it from the sunlight reflecting off of them. Um, so you know that dark cap is picking up quite a bit of heat and then you know that that's melting the hole so it can grow up out of. Uh, but there are some that supposedly do make some heat on their own. And so a couple of other examples like stuff like this um, this little martini cup, um, this on um, what used to call pseudoplectania. Uh, I've seen them like melt through a couple inches of ice, but you know, it's a black fungus and these are, these are sunny habitats they're in. 
Other things like the Lentinellus montanus typically are fruiting underneath the snow. And so you, know, you get you get like little holes like that. Sometimes you'll see them, but usually on these snow packs, you can see there's those little lip on the edge because you know there's enough, you know, the the dark soil is melting out underneath the edges of these snow packs. And then underneath those little shelves on the sticks, you'll get this lentinellus fruiting. Or you know, you get polypores like this, the really soft, squishy polypore. This is that little martini cup fungus. And you can see this is isis coming up through. This grows on little sticks. Stuff like um, gelatinodiscus is one that only grows on, um, mostly grows on yellow cedar, sometimes rarely on incense cedar needles on the edges of snowpacks. So it's a pretty specialized habitat. Stuff like Mycena overholtii is one that um, it really likes old growth trees, old growth forests, and unfortunately, a lot of the habitat now is old growth stumps. So these legacy stumps of these logged old growth forests, that's, you know, that's, if you want to find this thing, that's where you're going to look for it. And you can see that it literally will come up through the snow, um, or you get these little melt lines around where, where it's coming up. Foliota olivaceophila is a foliota that does this. There's some ectomycorrhizal fungi that do this. Most of them are decayers. Most of them are, are saphotropic. Um, so with this foliota, um, you know, it's just this normal gill foliota, but then we have this secotioid foliota that's also a snowbank fungus. And so here we have a mushroom that is not opening up. It's staying enclosed and the spores are not being forcibly discharged. And so with all these mushrooms we've seen so far, um, they're forcibly discharging spores, whether it be from the basidia, the club-like structure on the gill edge, or from you know, the acai, the straw, the tube-like structure that they're growing in. But this particular one is not discharging these spores. And so it's relying on, well, first of all, it's relying on the snowpack and the moisture from that to fruit. And so fruiting right on the edges of the melting snow. And then it's relying on something to eat it to spread the spores. And so you can see there's a couple bites out of it here, something started nibbling it there, but a little chomp out of it there. And so this is a, one of these sequoia fungi that relies on animals to eat them to spread the spores. And so I mentioned truffles earlier. Um, you know, like, this is a this is a, a you know a normal gilled mushroom that's becoming truffle-like. And so once again, you can see where things have been eating it here, little bites out of it here. It's mostly squirrels, rodents who are, who are eating these um, in, in North America. Um, before I move on, there was a question, do we have any snowpack mushrooms in the east? Um, there's, there's a mycena that's a really closely related to overholtii that'll fruit really early in the year. Um, I don't know if I necessarily call it a snowpack fungus, because a lot of these snowpack fungi in the west, they need a big, you know, a heavy snowpack to fruit. Um, it seems like that mycena just needs a log in cold, wet weather. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's a bad snow year out west, these things are not gonna fruit. Um, and, and, and then there's some question if, I mean, yeah, ITS is really close to that mycena, but there's morphological differences. So, you know, it depends on how much weight you put into just the single gene section to say you have one species and ignore ecology wise. With this, but you know, with, with these fungi, because they are, um, you know, because they're not forcibly discharging spores and they require something to eat them to spread the spores, that'll lead us to mushrooms and animals. And I'll use an example here of New Zealand, just because New Zealand's pretty spectacular. Uh, mushroom wise, it's probably the, the, you know, the most colorful area for mushrooms you can go. And then something walking, you know, like walking around under tree ferns that are 30 some feet tall, just, you know, you feel a little bit out of place. Uh, there's a lot of water in New Zealand. There's a lot of rain. It's a wet, it's a really wet habitat. You go next door, next door is what, 700 plus miles away. It's the closest point, Australia. Uh, it's a really dry habitat for the most part. There's some wet areas there, but most of it's dry. So even though this looks green, it is it is not green. Um, 
But in Australia, you had all of these marsupials, um, like taking the niche of, 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 you know, all of these, you know, these mammals that would be here. Um, stuff like bandicoots and, and, and powderus in, in places, in certain species, about 70% in their diet will be hypogeous fungi. So these truffle-like fungi. But New Zealand didn't have any, well, they didn't, they only had three species of land mammals and they're all bats. And two of those bats are flightless bats. And then they had, you know, they have um, seals and sea lions, the coastal stuff as well. Uh, but they had birds taking the niches of a lot of, you know, what, what mammals would do here, marsupials in Australia. And so what, what's happened in, in New Zealand is um, you have these, these truffle-like and, and sequoia-like fungi that are mostly on the surface and really brightly colored. I will mention that so this is New Zealand, Robin. This is what it's like sometimes in New Zealand where you literally can't walk without stepping on mushrooms. And yes, they have a blue antiloma. But you get a lot of stuff like this. And so what these are, are these fungi that they've all have, you know, they have close, you know, normal gilled relatives or poured relatives in the case of um, Ross beaver, which is closely related to Lexinum or the Loradiomyces. These are um, very closely related to chip cherries or the psilocybe, I mean, the magic mushrooms, uh, you have these brightly colored sequoioid forms of them. So think of these blobs on a stem, you know, pretty much just coming up. Don't put the energy into making this elaborate fruit body, just be a, you know, blob on a stick. And so when we look at the closest relatives of, of the New Zealand set, the Loradiomyces psilocybe, the sister species in Australia, like Loradiomyces cirrus, the um, chip cherries, which is introduced in North America, or, um, you know, psilocybe, the magic mushrooms, uh, you have, you know, the New Zealand representative in this group and the Australian representative. When we do the same thing for birds, we can look at, at you know, that versus that. So the Takeki in New Zealand, we'll look at it, it's, first of all, it's lost the ability to fly. Okay, so it's a, it's a flightless bird now. It has a giant bill, it has big feet, uh, it kind of like waddles around, eats its food, and plops down. You know, there was no there was no real predators for this bird, so it didn't really have it didn't have to you know fly in the trees, just hit hit on the tussock grass, stuff like that. Um, it didn't have to fly from water source to water source, food source to food source, like they did in Australia, because you know it wasn't dried up. There was food all over the place, and so they just became you know. You know, just this is kind of America right now, right? Just <laughs> becoming these blobs to lay around, um, just waiting to be fed. And so, so the Takeki, you know, was, was this was this niche bird, but it was wasn't the only one. There's about 40 or so different birds that did this in New Zealand, where you know they didn't really have they didn't have to fly their ground feeding ground dwelling. Okay, so with mushrooms, we'll come back to North America for a second, where we have these mushrooms, like in the habitats, like the, the Western Mountains, especially, where it's, you know, so yeah, you get that snowpack, but then you get these hot, dry summers, where there's no precip at all, or very little precip. Um, so if you have the ability to go from a above ground bolete to more of this deformed bolete, or in this case, lactarius, uh, and just sit there and wait for something to eat you, and you keep that progression growing and you go underground, your fruit body can last a lot longer. But so in, in North America, a lot of these dispersals for these fungi that lost the, um, lost the ability to forcibly discharge spores, they're eaten by rodents, you know, especially, you know, squirrels, blind squirrels, moles, voles. Uh, so they're going around, they're smelling these fungi and they're eating them. In Australia, there's these marsupials that take that niche. And so even though it sort of looks like a rat, it's not. Um, it's, a, it's a bandicoot. And New Zealand had a lot of these, these flightless birds that kind of filled that role. But because of that, a lot of the stuff in New Zealand was brightly colored and above ground. So when you're looking at this, you're looking at, you know, here's a bunch of fruit on the ground, except uh, one of those isn't fruit, but yeah, so you have the pigeons and the New Zealand pigeons, which are up in the treetops and, you know, you know how pigeons eat, they're kind of messy, and they're eating the podocarp seeds, and they're knocking a bunch to the ground, and you have these things in the ground coming along, eating them all up, 
and not really noticing the difference between the fungus and the berries. And so this one right here is a fungus. So New Zealand has a whole bunch of these brightly colored Sakoshoe fungi. And we can use an example of Lucaria. Um, so these are three different species from New Zealand. That's the normal above ground one. That's a fully below ground truffle forming one. That's kind of that Sakoshoe one that's, you know, part way above ground. And actually, we should be calling our Lucaria hidden angium, but that's a different talk. Hidden angium was described before Lucaria, and they're all belong the same genus. But so there's a whole bunch of Cortinarius, 20 some different species of Cortinarius, including at least five different species of purple Cortinarius like that in different sections. There's a bunch of different Boletes. So um, Boletus semigastroides is closely related to like Boletus separans, that, that oak associated group of you know, the edulis, the porcini, the oak associated porcinis. And so this is a you know gastrobolite like thing from New Zealand, and then uh, this is actually Ross Beaver and now um, is is a relative alexinum, and it, they even get the bolete molds growing on the hypomyces growing on these as well. So just like we saw that bolete mold earlier, this is growing on the bolete truffle. Stains blue too. There's entolomas that do this, you know the the angular spores to them. A bunch of things in Stropheriaceae, so you know, like Psilospe and Loradiomyces, the beautiful Clavogaster, and just a really neat blue one. And yeah, New Zealand has the blue entoloma and the blue Sakoshioid. So, and then one, one other thing they have is they have the stinkhorn in New Zealand. Okay, so we know what stinkhorns are, right? Well, I'll show you a, a few pictures of them. But so this is a stinkhorn that has, it doesn't have an odor. It's gleba, the spore mass, it's normally the stinky part on them is at the bottom of this underground. So right here. The only thing that's above ground is from about right there across. So this little grub sticking above ground. And so when, so the dispersal method, they think something had to come pluck that out of the ground and eat it. So birds probably saw this thing, thought that's a tasty grub, plucked it out, ate it, and spread the spores that way. So a lot of better stinkhorns, you know, they, they, they make these elaborate platforms of, you know, like flowers with the, the spore mass, the gleba, which just smells really bad on a lot of these things. Uh, I've seen like carrion beetles on this, flies on these things. They just like come either like crawl up the, the, the little tentacles and wallow through that and they, they fly off or walk off. And in the process, the spores get spread. There is this, this is another one from New Zealand, um, Colatus archeri, the, the stinky squid. And this thing is probably the worst smelling stinkhorn I've ever smelled. And so this was on a disc golf course in, in New Zealand. And there was a, you know, you could smell this thing long before you could see it. I mean, like walking around, it's like all of a sudden I smelled this thing. I was like trying to like follow my nose to find this patch. And so, it's, you know, there's about a hundred of them there. And it's like, you know, laying in the middle of them photographing this group of, of disc golfers came by and they're like staring at me. It's like wondering what I was doing. Um, because the whole area just stunk so bad. And then if that wasn't bad enough. I went back like three days later to get more photographs of it. And the same group of disc golf players walked by again and saw me there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm over getting embarrassed by this kind of stuff. Um, there's other things like the basket stinghorns. There's a you know bunch of different species of these. This is one that's introduced from Mediterranean Europe into Western North America or the white basket, this is another New Zealand one. And the spore mass, so the, the, this one here doesn't really have much of an odor. But what happens is they literally like, you know, the egg here. So, so these stink horns, a lot of them have this universal veil structure. So that, you know, the, the skin here and they pop up out of it. But this particular one, it literally springs up out of it. If you cut a, like this is cutting one in half, it's like the, you know, one of those compressed balls that spring up. And they literally spring into these like tumble ball like structures and then start rolling around the ground there. They're fascinating. But this is probably one that's still, um, you know, wind dispersed in a, in a way uh, and not insect dispersed, you know, because it, it, the, the gleba doesn't have the odor that's attracting dispersals. 
But then there's other things like like the netted stinkhorns, which have you know the the you know the gleba and often like these big um, these um, big uh, landing platforms of flower like structures. And so this is one that was in Cameroon that was um, had more of a floral odor to it, and its dispersal was was honeybees. And so. This was over a period of about 45 minutes we're seeing here uh, with about a photograph a minute. And what we're seeing is the honeybees coming in and clearing off all of the, um, you know, the, the gleba, the spore mass from this fungus. And then we're also seeing the net unfurl and kind of like drop. And this is once again, just, you know, you can stand there and watch this and see it move. And by the time it was fully open, um, you can see the spore mass is pretty much gone. So the, the, the spore mass on this is this olive goo that's kind of like on the morel-like half of this thing. And the honeybees are coming and clearing it out really quickly. And then there's also some fungus gnats on there as well, these little um, fungus gnats there as well. And so this is it's pretty much cleared off, but there's still residue odor and, and the bees are getting every last spore. So what's happening is, so the, there's this glebal mass with a lot of these stinkhorns, when you touch it, it sticks to your finger really quickly. It's like, you know, it's a sticky substance, but then it also dries really quickly. And that was especially noticeable on the Iliodicnion, the, um, the white, um, the white, lattice ball. That stuff had really sticky gleba, but within seconds of it being on your, so wet, sticky, within seconds being on your hand, it dry into like really fine powder, uh, you know, almost like, you know, baby powder, face powder or something, and immediately dust off. So that was, you know, the, so anything it touched, it just like, you know, immediately, you know, scurped off and, and it was gone pretty much. So the couple of things here, what is the benefit of the net? So a lot of these these netted stinkhorns are they smell like um, like uh, like carrion like dead flesh and stuff and they attract they attract like burying beetles to them and the burying beetles just like climb up the net to the spore mass. Um, I would imagine here with this one the net is it almost it's probably flower like as well for bees. Um, the ball structure to them um, with the Iliodictyon, the white one, it's probably easy for this thing to blow around and disperse as far as that way. So you don't know, just get out there and, and roll around to, to spread the spores. You've seen these things like floating down rivers and stuff. Um, and so they do, uh, they're lightweight and they blow around. The, so a lot of stink horns, you know, if you, if you, the stems are, it's almost like, you know, really, I sell, you know, styrofoam almost really lightweight. Um, with stuff like this one, I don't know, just to look cool. But, you know, the, the gleba mass is the inside, um, you know, this dark spore mass on the inside of the ball. And when it's in this stage, it, when it's immature, it doesn't have an odor. It doesn't have the odor until it's mature. And so technically all stinkhorns are edible. And I actually ate this species and I ate them in the egg stage. And so you like cook these things up. It's kind of weird. It's like almost like cooking um, the the tree ears, the um, auricularia, the little jelly fungus you get in like um, hot and sour soup and stuff. And so it kind of like pops out of the frying pan. And then I swear like 30 minutes after I ate this thing, the spores matured in my stomach and I was burping up stinkhorn goo. Yeah, I was not worth it. <laughs> um, so the benefit to the bees, probably no benefit. And they're probably just getting fooled by this. And, you know, the mushroom's probably fooling it into thinking that it's a nectar. And, um, you know, maybe it has some carbohydrates, maybe there's some sugars in there. But uh, I would imagine the mushroom's tricked into being a dispersal agent. And so this is, this, you know, the bee dispersal stuff happened, was happening in Cameroon. And with the, the Baca, the um, indigenous pygmy people from that area, um, what they'll do is they'll smear the gleba on a leaf and track, you know, 
put it out there and the honeybees will come to it and they'll track the honeybees back to the hive and get the honey. So they use the sting horns to track the bees back to the hive. So the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is this group of marasmias. Uh, so marasmias are, you know, the, the pinwheel mushrooms or the parachute mushrooms are really, um, a really beautiful group of fungi, really common in the tropics. We have a bunch in North America as well, um, just, but you really start getting into diversity of them in, in the tropics. And so this is one that described from Cameroon that has all these black rhizomars growing near. And these are just like little short pieces and, you know, elsewhere in this branch is like three, four, five inch, you know, rhizomars sticking up out of it. And what they are, are these group of litter trapping uh, marasmias. So what they do is they're in the mid story and they send out these nets and it's really hard to get photographs of them without looking like an absolute tangled mess. Uh, they send out these black rhizomorphic nets. And so they string from branch to branch, you know, across these, you know, these trees, mid story branches. And as litter is falling from the upper canopy, it gets caught up in these rhizomars and hangs up there. And within a day or so, the mycelium like glues them in place. It grows on them. You can see these little sticky nodules. Um, if you look at all these little connection points, it has these little, you know, kind of like these mycelial pads that are holding it in place. Okay, so, it, so this fungus has the ability to catch the food because it's growing on the litter before it hits the floor. Um, to get it to step up in all the competition that's on the forest floor. So by forming these, these rhizomorphic nets mid-story, it, you know, it's got first dibs and the stuff coming down. And so here, you know, all these sticks you're seeing here are all stuff that in leaves are stuff that's been caught up in these, in these nets. And then, you know, this, it's a lot easier to photograph them when they actually have the fruit bodies coming up out of the stems. So that's, this is the, you know, most, the structure of the fungus, yeah, it's, it's these, black rhizomorphs, but it's also this mycelium you can't see inside of the substrate there, inside these leaves and twigs. But what's really cool about these things is there's about um, 100 species known so far of birds that take these rhizomorphs and use them in their nests. And it turns out that these rhizomorphs are really important for, um, for a, you know, structure of the nest, so they're really strong threads uh, for keeping nests dry. So they're not retaining moisture. They have anti-parasite properties to them. So antibacterial and anti-parasite properties. So um, <clears throat> they're using different species, some species to use as the structure of the nest and other species to use as the nest liner. So the nest liners seem to have more anti-parasite properties to them. Um, and then that structure stuff, you know, are these, these thicker threads that really hold together really well. And so there's a um, paper I was part of that, that um, looked into this, uh, you know, this, this group of rhizomorphic forming marasmias and bird nest association with them. So, that, you know, that's something you can, you can go look up. Um, so the question is here, I wonder if animals use armillaria rhizomorphs to build their homes. I haven't seen it, uh, but it's certainly possible. But typically by the time you see armillaria rhizomorphs, it's dead. Uh, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're older and brittle. They're not as pliable anymore. So, you know, with, with, the, with the armillaria, the honey mushroom, it forms these sheets of rhizomorphs in, in the xylem layer, the wood underneath the bark. And then when usually like, you know, when the tree is long dead and you peel back the bark, it'll be visible to air. But typically by that point, they're, they're kind of brittle. Um, with, with these marasmioid threads, um, they are, they're more pliable. Really. And, you know, some are, some are like hair thin, some are, you know, this, this is a bigger species, a little bit thicker. So with that, I will open it up to questions. And I hope you're fascinated by some of these fungi. Oh, I don't know how anyone could not be Noah. That was just stunning. Thank you. And, you know, I feel like we learned so much <clears throat> and just see the eye candy alone, like is incredible. So thank you. That was just awesome. You already have uh, a question 
in the chat from Devin, uh, who is saying, going back to stinkhorns, do certain stinkhorn species form particular geometric structures? Um, like one only would form a circular netting versus another one, would it only form hexagonal type patterns? Or yeah, every, every stinkhorn is a little bit different. Um, like with the Colatris, the Colatris rubber, the one I showed you the picture of is kind of like, you know, that, that the basket with kind of like these irregular openings. Colatris crispa, the one you can find in Florida, has these perfect circular openings on the lattice. Uh, with the netting, I don't think I've looked closely enough at stinkhorn nets. I'll check my photo. I have a bunch of different species of them. Um, I'll check and see, but I, I think I remember Phallus multicolor having more rounded, but I don't remember. But in, in terms of why that would be useful, I don't know. You know, climbing up a round net versus a long gate net, yeah, I probably benefited something at some point to make it go that way, but what, I don't know. And it's worth mentioning that, that stinkhorns have all evolved from truffle forms. And so it was a way to get back up above ground to disperse spores. And so I, I didn't really touch on that here. It's something I talk about in my truffle talks. Um, you know, where, where history and GM stuff like that, they're, they're stinkhorn truffles. And so they, they are forming these underground stink balls. And then some of them decided we didn't want to be underground anymore. So Faye bailed out, Al, but that grub like one was the, you know, the, the lowest lineage of the above ground form. So they kind of all like evolved from that coming back. I was like, okay, so I want to come back above ground now. And then so they needed that, they needed that way to disperse spores once they got above, above ground. So. Well, you got a lot of questions during the talk, but if anyone wants to pop on and just ask a question, you're you're also welcome to. If you don't feel like typing. You don't have to be afraid to unmute and ask. So are there other forms that puffballs or truffles can evolve into morphologically? Yeah, so um, uh, a good example of this is um, uh, Alaphomyces, uh, the one I showed you with the Philip Palladium on it. Um, there is, um, there's a species, it actually grows in Guyana and in Japan. And let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Um, it, it's this Alaphomyces that probably wasn't getting dispersed underground. So it sent this big stem up out of it. And so it's a pseudotelostoma volveda. Uh, but I do have photos of it. I will try to pull up quickly here. Um, so it, it, you know, it's just pretty much, you gotta think of this truffle was underground. It's like, okay, I don't wanna be underground anymore. I wanna disperse some better way because, you know, probably because it wasn't getting eaten enough underground. Um, and so it came up above ground. And so let's see if I can share this. And so this is a, this is an Alaphomyces. I mean, genetically, it is in the middle of Alaphomyces. But so it's a truffle that you know every other species but one is a below ground tuber. Most of them, are, some of them are surface dwelling. Um, actually, the ones here in Guyana are, are surface dwelling. Um, and so then it, it just pops up and pushes this spore mass up on the stem two or three inches up in there. And so here was an example where it was not getting dispersed below ground and needed to get dispersed above ground. So here was a truffle coming above ground. Um, I guess that's, and then this is an example of a Laphomyces there that probably the fruit bodies are there for a really long time because a bunch of them have like moss and stuff growing on them, which suggests that they were sitting on the surface for a while. Um, cool. Thank you. Yep. Here. I'm just going to jump in and say you never disappoint. My front door is still open. Uh, thanks, Connie. It's good seeing you. 
I will mention that the first time I went to DC, Connie hosted me and she it was actually my first time I was ever in DC and she took me out at around midnight and we went out after the talk I gave and we're going around the monuments around downtown. I think we were at um, the Lincoln Memorial and she found the giant puffball that was kind of rotten. And I heard this yell behind me, bombs away. And she proceeded to drop kick this puffball all over the place. So I was like, someone who does that is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, I am not on Twitter. I am on Instagram with Micah Hobo, but I don't use Instagram very much. I'm on Facebook as well. I'm just not a big social media poster. I'm told I have to do it, but I don't really want to do it. Uh, but but he's on to... INAT, so post stuff on INAT. And maybe I'm on we'll iNaturalist, it. and I'm happy to look at people's observations on there. If you tag me in them, I'll see them. Um, to know what underscore Siegel and INAT, um, you know, feel free to, to tag me and stuff if you want an ID confirmation, you want me to look at something because that's pretty much the only way I'll see stuff if you tag me in it. And if you take really good photos and find interesting stuff, I'll look at all your stuff um, if I have time. Hey Noah, I just wanted to say hi, it's Jody Ristich. It was really great to uh, see some of your photographs and hear you talk, it's just, uh, Amazing. Mm, thanks, Jody. So were some of the, like you've got some that are gone to truffle and some that seem to be in between. Are that is that some sort of intermediate stage? Like, are we seeing things progress in a certain way? It, yeah, there's no, once you lose the ability to forcibly discharge spores, there's been no examples of getting it back. So most mushrooms forcibly discharge spores. You know, the, the, the whole Bure's drop of the, you know, the, the, the moisture on the surface of the spore touching, eventually touching the um, ceramata is causing the spore to shoot off. Um, or, you know, the, the, the pressure built up in an assay. Um, so once you lose that ability, which all these truffle, not all, most of the truffle like fungi have, um, there's no getting it back. And so, um, so once you lose the ability, you either a truffle and you're emitting an odor, you need something to eat you to disperse you, or you're coming back above ground, you know, in the, the stinkhorn method, or you know, that one example, the, the pseudotelostoma method, uh, deciding that you're gonna stick your spores on a stick and come back up above, above ground. Right, thanks. Um, I guess, I'm I'm trying to fit because you've got so many genus that are that are doing this. Is there something innate in them? Is there some sort of genetic thing that they're able to do this? It's just not being utilized, and yet some of them decide to start turning it on or something. No, it's it's, it's more environmental pressures. Um, so, like I mean, it, and it's really easy to see this. So there's probably 1,500 species or so hypogeus fungi in the in the West Coast. And so what do you have there? You have montane areas that like, you know, Sierra Nevada Cascade, especially east side of Cascade in Sierra Nevada, it gets most of its precip as snow in the winter. And then so the snow melts, you have a wet period, you have soil moisture, but you don't have surface moisture. And so it's caused a lot of these fungi to, um, to survive by going underground. You know, they probably started, you know, you start going under duff and, um, you know, you, you have you have examples of you know these intermediate phases all over the place. Um, I can see if I can quickly pull up an example of this here. Uh, but you know, you have um, you know years and years of, of these pressures of you know if you're below ground, your fruit body can sit there for a really long time. Uh, you have a much better chance of survival. And then it seems like the same thing happens in really wet habitats um, where, you know, where, where too much moisture will decay your fruit body. So, so if you become a, a sequoia fungus, you can last longer that way. Because I can't pull up the talk really quickly. Uh, if you look on, I, I think one of my truffle talks is on, YouTube still, I don't have very many talks online, but you can check YouTube for um, 
Uh, I've heard a truffle talk. There may be a version up there. Cool. Appreciate it, man. All right. What, any more questions here? There was... Um, Can you use, have you tried using chat GBT to answer mushroom relay questions and how good was it? It's not there yet. I don't have to worry about being replaced yet. Um, there's a lot, I mean, it's true, Derek, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet, especially about fungi. And so when that's your source for drawing to answer questions, um, if your information's bad, your, your answers are gonna be bad. So. Um, maybe someday when when there's when there's more, you know, better information on the internet, it'll be better at writing your mushroom book for you. But for the time being, I think I think it's safe. Okay, anybody else? I bet if we stayed on, people could probably keep thinking of questions because that was just like a lot of a lot of food for thought, but Maybe we I'm should call it a night. So. <laughs> oh, you are great. Okay, great. So if you have people, if you know, I can stay. If people have anything, um, you, you showed a lot of intertidal mushrooms. Has any mushroom been found that has parasitized intertidal creatures, like oysters or clams or or uh, crabs? There. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. I. The I hopped in. You were you were showing mushrooms that seem to to live on the beach. Is there any been found who parasitizes intertidal creatures like crabs um, or, or oysters? There's probably fungi that have, but I don't think there's mush. There's no mushrooms that have. So there's there's fungi that grow on everything, including saltwater stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of um, on you know mushrooms on on them not nothing nothing I've ever heard of. Okay, I'm just trying to respond to private messages in the chat as well. But anybody else have a? Yeah, going back to uh, snow melt fungi. Yep. Do you do you think on the east coast maybe we're just not looking at high enough elevation? That's possible, um, but you don't. I mean, it'd be worth checking because I mean, you you the the the, the snowmelt fungi in the west are they're pretty much all conifer stuff. Most of it. there's there's some ascomyces that will grow on like um, the shrub ceanothus and chinkapin. Um, which are what are, I don't know the common names for them. Um, oh, chinkapin is a, a it's a chestnut relative. Um, so you know, this is like you know the woody shrub tobacco bush. Um, so they they grow on like the hardwood stems and stuff. Uh, Susan Hopkins mentioned the uh, uh, Sarcosoma um, globosum, that that really gelatinous, which is a it's just I mean it's a it's a I don't know if I would call it a snowbank fungus, but it, it's something that fruits literally as soon as the ground clears. Yeah, but it, think, as soon think, as it gets warm, it's going to come up. Yeah. And found it's associated with spruce, and it's a south-facing slope, always in the exact same places. I have four places that I look along the same trail. It's old mm -hmm. stands of planted spruce. But it, have you found it years where you haven't had a snowpack? I, I, I count them. I don't pick them. I count them. Yeah, but, but does there's, it grow there's, in years? There's no snowpack. I have pictures with it in the snow. Yeah. And it just, I think it, like the difference between the West Coast stuff is like it literally needs feet of snow on the ground that slowly yeah. melts yeah, off. In the East Coast stuff, I mean, the stuff that I know of, like the Mycena and the, and the, the Sarcosoma, um, I think it'll just, it'll fruit with or without snow, it just roots really, really early in the year, as soon as it falls. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to say, is you have to sort of be in the right place at the right time. And you're the way the weather has been so screwball around me lately, I, I, I should go out on that trail now and see and dig and see if they are under there starting to come up. It, it's actually being March. It, it's, it's been warm enough 
and a couple of sunny days, they could be growing under the snow. I'll have to look. Yeah. A little tricky to get in there for me, but yeah. Yeah, that would be a really interesting thing to know. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, um, no, do you have um, do you have a name for the early spring Mycena in the east? I, I think for a while they may have been calling it Mycena aprilis, um, but I, I think that name has disappeared from Michael Quebec. Are they calling it Levigatus or Overholtii now? So they, they merged it with so, Overholtii. Yeah, so the, I know genetically it was really close to over Haltii, but I think it was it matched something else. I'll have to look that one up. But it, I mean it I, looks I, like over Haltii. No, nah, it looks like a gray mycena. It, it doesn't look like over Haltii. Over Haltii is a big mycena with a really distinct oh. gill attachment. Oh, um, there, okay. There's there's morpho differences to it, both macro and micro, uh, but it has a really close ITS. Hmm. All right, thanks. Doesn't mean it's the same. <laughs> Depends, and depends on, on um, is there any other chat messages I've missed? Uh, what makes mushrooms bright colored? Um, nobody knows. <laughs> they wanna be colorful. You gotta remember a lot of things out there don't see colors the same way we do. Um, and especially things associated with fungi, you know, things that are eating them. like. You know, slugs aren't going to see them. Fungus gnats aren't going to see them. These things are not, the birds aren't going to see them the same colored we are. They're going to see these things in these, you know, different wavelengths that we're not seeing things in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Nobody really knows. You know, they just, they just want to be cool. I mean, if every single mushroom was like this little brown, dull, boring thing, would you look at them? If you could eat them, yeah, probably, huh? Quick question. So um, I found I found a very interesting lactarius like three years ago, but the next year it was not there. It, it, the three years ago, it was a whole patch. So usually when you see a whole patch, it could be like, because there are a lot of food for it, but it could also be the food is running out. So they're desperate trying to get the spore out. So my question is like, if you find it the first year, then it's not coming back the next year. The third year is not coming back. When do you give up? Do you just keep going back, trying to wishing you can still find it? Uh, you never <laughs> give up. <laughs> um, you may, just keep checking. Up, but but yeah, giving up on particular patches. Yeah. So it all depends on the mushroom. Um, like say, say you're hunting a Ganoderma, a varnish shell on a hemlock stem. And you go there like two years after your tree's dead and it's covered with it. And in three years, it, there's quite a bit, but not as much. And you know you have this progression where it's it'll use up the food source in that stump, and then there'll be nothing left for it. And you know it'll it'll have to find a, you know spores would have to find a new suitable growing place, or you know or it failed in life. Yeah, um, if, it, if it's eating the tree, right. it's easier to 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 decide. Yes. Like but if in, it's in like terms a, of like something like a, a mycorrhizal, fungus, mycorrhizal, like, yeah, like, symbiotically with the tree, it can be years and years and years. Um, where you don't find it because conditions aren't right. You know, say it's, it's too dry, it, you know, it didn't rain, it didn't, you know, there's no moisture there. Um, and then, you know, conditions are right and everything pops up like like 2021. You know, okay. there's mushrooms that fruited that I hadn't seen since 2011. 10 years had gone by since that last extremely wet summer. Um, and then they all came up and they were everywhere. And then they'll disappear again until conditions are right again. So yeah, it, ectomycorrhizal stuff, never give up on it. Uh, stuff that, you know, decayers that are, you know, as soon as that substrate's gone, you're gonna have to find a new patch. No, I noticed um, last summer, which was a real drought in for a lot of the East Coast, um, there were a lot of uh, sightings of Boletus purpureo rubellus, which was growing in swamps that were dry. So normally those areas would be underwater. And it was I, essentially, I think it was fruiting because of the drought. Are there other okay, but mushrooms what, that what do that? What else happened that summer? 
So what else happened last year for purpurea rubellus that hadn't happened before? I don't know. It was put on the rare 20 list and oh, yeah, right. an excuse to go look for it. But that's um, true. <laughs> So I don't, know, I don't know if we can take any, I think that w once you start looking for stuff, you're going to find stuff. Uh, but in terms of there's certain things that like a hot dry summer mushroom for me is a Garicus and the Compestris group. They are not out in wet years. Which one? They're out in the, a Garicus Compestris, the metal oh, mushrooms, that whole yeah. group. Um, if I want to find those mushrooms, I need a hot dry summer to find them here. You know, in the, in the in the wet years, the normal years, I'm not going to see them. And then in those hot, dry years, that's when they come up. So there are certain mushrooms that that want the hot, dry weather. Um, but yeah, most don't. <laughs> but in terms of yeah, in terms of stuff that's growing in really wet areas, then probably a little bit drier helps them. But a lot of the like the cedar swamps or something that those Papua rubellus are growing in, there's a lot of hummocks there, and they can there's a lot of gradient up and down. And I think that if you go in a good year and look for them, you'll probably find a lot more than you find in a bad year. But you'll actually be looking for them. You know what to look for, so. What's your camera setup? Oh, camera setup. Um, my favorite setup was the Nikon D90 and the 60 millimeter, except the D90 hasn't been made in about 10 years. And um, I had a used one until a couple of years ago and that finally broke. Um, I've been using like the 7,000, 7,100, 7,200. They don't last very long for me. Um, cameras get abused by me because they're always out in the rain on the ground. Uh, and I pretty much always use the 60 millimeter macro, but any, you know, any, I like the, you know, the, the cheaper, not not the cheapest because I, I want functions. I want every function where I don't even have to look at a screen. I don't want to look at a screen to use the camera. I want to know where everything is just and without having to look at it. Uh, so that's why I really like the D90 and the, the D7000 series. So it's now up to like 7,500 or something. Well, they've gotten rid of them. I'm using DSLRs. Um, I have an 810, but I hate it. That's like the, the next line up and I can't wait to get rid of it. Um, so much that I've barely been taking mushroom photos in the last year because of it. Um, but I probably will have to get a, a mirrorless next because they're just DSLRs are gone. So, you know, that the F6, F7, I've used one. Shannon has one, I use hers, so pretty fancy. Do you like it? I do, but you're gonna have to invest a couple thousand dollars in it. Yeah. How sharp is the knife you use for all those cross sections? I use these, these disposable um, little exacto blades. And yeah, I just happen to have one sitting on the counter because I have them all over the place. You go to Harbor Freight Tools and they're like 69 cents each. You don't have to worry about losing them um, because I lose knives all the time. And so, you know, it's, it's a extremely thin blade. So, you know, it's just, and, and, you know, it's about two inches long. So you can get really clean sections with them. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can't use big chunky knives um, because you break mushrooms. But with the, you know, sharp blades, really sharp blades on these, they're really cheap. You can buy replacement blades for about 10 cents each, as long as you don't lose it. Um, you know, I usually have three or four within reach at all times. You can't pry mushrooms off logs of them, but if you're setting up to photograph them, um, it's it's the best thing to use for cross sections because you can get really clean cross sections. Cool, thanks. Okay. So I hope to see some of you in, in mushroom season at an actual event. Um, I think I, just agreed to do the link off for for Western Pennsylvania Club on September 30th. So oh, that's great. fairly close to you. That's um, awesome. But that's one of the only East Coast events I've planned this year. So sweet. Are you what about NEMF? Are you, you usually do that, right? Or? I usually I haven't heard from them yet. If I'm invited, oh. I'll I will try to go. I'm in Alaska a lot this year, so I have to like make sure I'm back in time. Nice. Well, we'll definitely go to Link Off for then. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you so much, Noah. And thank you, everyone. It was awesome to get the questions and participation. This was terrific.